David Montgomery. I'm happy to be here talking to you today about the big picture about soil and soil erosion, soil conservation, and so on. But I'd like to start by giving my greetings to my friends at Minokin Farm in Burley County. Um, sorry I couldn't be there in person to uh, talk to you about this, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to uh, touch base and, and follow through on conversations that we've had. I've learned much visiting the farm in the past. Uh, so let me get started. Um, let me share my screen here. I've been asked to talk about the big picture in terms of in terms of soil erosion uh, and soil conservation. So many of you may know me as uh, the author or co-author of one of these books, Dirt the Hidden Half of Nature, uh, Growing a Revolution or What Your Food Ate. It's a series of books that I've written uh, with um, in collaboration with my wife, Anne Beclay, the co-author on two of them. She's a biologist, I'm a geologist, my natural maybe that we'd be writing about soil. But back when I wrote Dirt, I never thought that we'd be writing a whole series of books about soils. I started thinking that I wanted to research uh, what had happened in the past, the, sto the story of soil erosion in past societies. Societies. And I tell that story and that history in the dirt book, but it opened my eyes to thinking about the problem of land degradation, soil degradation in particular, and what that means for human societies at present and what that means for society in the future going forward. Uh, there's a lot of lessons from history in that book. I'll share some of them with you today in terms of trying to lay out the big picture here. Uh, but The Hidden Half of Nature, the second book in the series, uh, looks at the role of microbial ecology, the science of bacteria and fungi in the soil in particular, and how that affects um, uh, the health of crops, how it affects soil fertility, the productivity of the land. It's the science behind how to treat and solve the problems I wrote about in the dirt book. Growing a Revolution takes that one step further to look at how farmers around the world are adopting regenerative practices to rebuild the fertility of their land, to literally bring life back to their land uh, in remarkably short order in terms of the timescales that geologists like myself tends to think about. And the most recent book, What's Your Food Ate, that Ann and I uh, put out last year, uh, it looks at the role of soil health in human health and tries to connect the dots between why taking care of the land in ways that build soil health translate into healthier crops, healthier livestock, and healthier people. Ideas that have been bounced around for a long time, but there's been a lot of science in the last 50 years that actually supports the idea that there are linkages that can be identified and tracked through that whole causal um, chain going from the soil to us. So let me start here with the big picture. Since I've been asked to talk about the big picture, let's go really big here. Uh, and I want, since I am a professor, I wanted to start with a quiz. Now, don't worry about your grade. I'm not going to grade it. There's only one question, and you can choose which is the right answer. But the quiz is, which of these planets would you rather live on? The blue one or the red one? Uh, you can take your pick. Uh, I'm going to pick the blue one. It's far more habitable. It's got some very major advantages over that red one in terms of, well, first of all, the color. There's a lot of water on Earth, the blue planet. Um, and secondly, there's an atmosphere that we can breathe on Earth. Both of those things make it very convenient for uh, habitation by carbon-based life forms like us. But there's a third piece of planetary scale habita habitability, the really big picture, that often gets left off in uh, the, 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 the table when we think about what's crucially important to maintain in terms of Earth's life support systems for us and our civilizations. And that's given away by this little scrap of brown over here in the corner on the left, uh, standing in for soil. Earth is the only planet that we know of that has soil, let alone healthy, fertile soil. And soil, when you think about it, is the marriage of geology and biology. It's the, it's the boundary between the dead world of geology and the living world of biology. A lot of organic, the, the constituent, the elemental constituents that make up the bodies of plants and animals actually originated in rocks. And we have to get them out of the rocks, into the soil, and into people and plants uh, to support biological activity on this planet. Um, and it's that component that I've been focused on and that Anne's been focused on for a while now and thinking about uh, not what makes it important on the big scale, but how to actually conserve it and to improve it and enhance it on the big scale. And that's an important thing, um, in part because if you look back at the history of how people have interacted with landscapes since the, the end of the last ice age, there's a long history of people uh, degrading the land, their landscapes in ways that actually very much influenced the course and fate of the subsequent civilizations and their own descendants. That's Those are the stories that I wrote about in Dirt when we looked back at the sort of the catalog of human civilization since the end of the last ice age. And I, I originally thought I was writing a book about soil erosion. And it turned out I wrote a book about the history of farming through the lens of soil erosion, yes. Um, but what I learned along the way was very instructive uh, for my own uh, 
education and edification, and it got me very interested in thinking about how we could reverse the pattern of soil degradation that's shown on this global map. Now, this is uh, the UN's map of global soil degradation from oh, probably about 15 years ago, back about the time that I was writing dirt. Uh, and you'll notice that there's a lot of red on the map, There's a lot of degraded and very degraded soil by the UN's estimation. And you can ignore all the yellow areas on the map. You can think of sort of anywhere that people have been living in, in high concentrations and farming or places that are climate, climatologically vulnerable show up as either yellow or red. But notice all the red stuff on the map, very degraded soils. They tend to be concentrated in areas where uh, farming activity, farming and grazing activity have been concentrated for a while in some places, like in North Africa and in the Middle East, or more recently in terms of North and South America, um, in terms of the, the degraded areas there. By, by the best estimates that I can come up with in reviewing the scientific literature, uh, the experts estimate that we've degraded between about a quarter and a third of the world's potentially farmable agricultural land to the point where it's no longer used in agriculture. That's a lot of land that's been put out of commission already in the last 10,000 years, much of it in the last century. Um, but the point of this graph is really to basically make the case that uh, humanity, through our collective actions on this planet, have managed to degrade an awful lot of the soil that we depend on to grow our food. And this is a situation that I think we need to reverse this century, uh, if only because it's still ongoing. Uh, the UN's Global State of the Soil Assessment from 2015, a few years back, noted that humanity, the global us, loses about 0.3% of our global food production capacity each and every year to ongoing soil loss and soil degradation. Now that 0.3% doesn't sound like a big deal in any given year. It's not. It's a third of a percent. But if you let it play out over the long haul, it adds up. If you take that 0.3% per year and, and play that out with the way that we're on track to over the, the next the rest of this century, it would degrade another quarter to a third of the world's global farmland, which would put us at by the year 2100 at probably having degraded close to 50% of our ability to grow food on this planet while our population increases by another third. That spells trouble down the road. But if we look back through history, we can find lessons that this is not the first time that the idea of a land degradation may, uh, may ultimately impact the course and fate of human societies. It's happened many times in the past. And in researching the dirt book, I came away with the conclusion that soil erosion and degradation played a role, and I would argue a key role, in the demise of ancient civilizations all the way back to Neolithic or Bronze Age Europe, or even earlier if you wanted to go back to um, the, the earliest days of agriculture in the Middle East, Classical Greece, Rome, the southern United States, Central America, Angkor Wat, uh, the earliest agricultural areas of China. I could go on. I listed them all in the dirt book and looked at their histories. But what comes very clear when you look back at the, 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 uh, the environmental history of agricultural lands is that the kind of soil degradation that has often been attributed to helping to contribute to undermine societies didn't happen simply because of the deforestation that's usually uh, pointed to when thinking about the problem, but it actually came from a different culprit. It was the plow that followed the axe that really was the main culprit in terms of the wholesale loss of soil off of certain regions around the globe so far uh, and the degradation of, of agricultural fertility. Um, and that can seem a little counterintuitive. I mean, you know, uh, tillage is one of those things that uh, you know the, most of us non-farmers think of. Uh, so what farmers do when we think about what farmers do, other than grow food, how do they do it? Well, they plow. It's part of the, the... And there's real reasons why farmers have long done that in terms of weed control and preparing weed uh, uh, seed beds for planting. But what, the other thing that the plow does, as you're all, I'm sure, aware, is it leaves the soil bare and vulnerable to the erosion by wind or rain after the first pass... Before before, after the plast of the plow and before uh, plants um, uh, recolonize that, that disturbed ground. And turning the land over, it makes it vulnerable to erosion. Uh, and this is, happens to be a very dramatic increase in the pace of erosion that you can track through societies in the past and having started the clock ticking in terms of the degradation of their soil before it added up to fairly big impacts uh, and big lessons that we can learn since we're facing a, a potentially similar situation at a global scale over the course of the coming century as we we're just talking about. So as we go back and look at past societies, um, the, the, the reliance on over tillage, plowing too often, 
um, has a long history. I'm going to, I'm not going to go into every society that I wrote about in dirt. If you're really interested in that history, I obviously recommend the book. That's why I wrote all this stuff down and researched it. But what I want to share with you first is the story of classical Greece. Um, and it's a story that many of us are not familiar with, uh, but it goes back to the very roots of Western civilization. Uh, when cycles of erosion and soil formation in ancient Greece began with a Bronze Age erosion event right after the introduction of plow-based agriculture from uh, locations in Asia Minor. So when the plow arrived in the Greek peninsula, um, it, things started to change. Agriculture arrived. And Tiered Van Andels, a guy who actually taught me uh, sophomore geology when I was back in college, and Chris Reynolds, who is a, a archaeologist, worked a lot on this stuff back in, in the Greek landscape back in the 1980s. And they did an environmental reconstruction where they documented that the Greek landscape, when the, at the arrival of the plow, when agriculture kind of first arrived in, in the area, it was open oak woodland. So there was you know, space between the trees, about a one to three feet of soil soil on the hillsides, uh, rich uh, valley alluvial valley bottoms um, uh, down by the streams. Uh, and so you can guess where farmers first started farming this landscape. They went for the easily plowed, um, well-watered land down in the valley bottoms. Uh, and then as the population grew, they spread up onto the hillsides such that cultivation you know, spread from the valley bottoms up onto the hillsides. And by the peak of, of classical Greece, or by the peak of the Bronze Age in Greece, many areas of Greece, um, the, uh, there were fields that extended up the valley sides on sloping hills, you know, almost up to ridge crests. Um, and what happened is that over generations, erosion of that soil ended up piling up down in the valley bottoms. So that if you go there today, what you find is a lot of the soil that used to be on the hillsides is now piled up on top of the alluvium, in the, the old alluvium in the valley bottoms. And you have bare hillsides that have scrubby maquis vegetation where you can still find Bronze Age agricultural implements that were used to grow wheat or to harvest wheat uh, on those bare hillsides where you could not grow crops today. Uh, the, the extent of the landscape that's potentially farmable has shrunk over time. And this is something that Van Andel and Reynolds were very interested in and wrote about um, fairly extensively back at the, in the 1980s. And they put this, this graph together that was one of the graphs that really got me starting to think about writing the Dirt Book back in the early 2000s. What they did is they took their geoarchaeological studies, their studies of the geology, soils, and archaeology of the region, and particularly in the southern Argolis a particular region of southern Greece where they uh, plotted the population density over time from 6,000 BC up to you know fairly recently the, the, the millennium near 2000 and at different times through history they tried to ask they estimated how many people were occupying this landscape um, and what they found was a, a very interesting pattern a uh, pattern that got me really thinking about the role of soil and its, its, uh, its a loss in terms of setting the life cycle time uh, longevity of human civilization. So there's two characteristics of this curve that are interesting. One of them is trivial and the other I think is really important. The trivial one, well first let's describe it. So population rose up into the Bronze Age when farming first arrived in the Greek landscape, it then crashed for a thousand years, it rose up again after a dark age in the age of classical Greece, uh, you had another thousand year run at high productivity, it crashed again for a thousand years, and then uh, in the modern age, uh, the population bounced back to its highest level ever. Uh, and that highest level now on this third cycle is, is fairly trivial. I think we can all appreciate how modern farming techniques can allow us to grow more food and support more people on the landscape than Bronze Age farming techniques. You know, and the answer there is technology. We have a far better technology, far better energy sources and the ability to, to apply power to things than we did in the Bronze Age. No mystery there. Um, so the amplitude of the signal getting higher each, as each civilization occupies this landscape shouldn't be that much of a surprise. But what about the periodicity? Why, why, that's the part that intrigued me. Why this rise, drop, rise, drop, rise? There's not that many places in the world where you can basically, where it's been occupied by three successive agricultural civilizations. Um, and that started me wondering about, oh, well, what could the role of land degradation have played in setting the tempo of the rise and fall of civilizations in the Greek landscape. Now, as often turns out in geology and many other fields, there aren't a whole lot of really truly original ideas. And as I was uh, researching this question about the Greek landscape, I of course went back and read some of the works by early uh, classical Greek philosophers such as Plato. 
Uh, and he wrote about the problem of the Bronze Age soil erosion event at when he was writing at the peak of classical Greek civilization. He was writing about the previous uh, peak in civilization and the dark age that fell in between when he wrote that the rich soft soil has all run away, leaving the land nothing but skin and bone. He was looking at soil erosion off of farmed fields. But in those days, the damage had not taken place. The hills had high crests and the rocky plain of Phellus was covered with rich soil and the mountains were covered by thick woods of which there are some traces today. He was basically recognizing a previous erosion event that resulted from Bronze Age farming. And he went so far as to look at and describe in his dialogues uh, the, the state of river mouths draining off the Greek landscape into the Mediterranean. And he compared rivers that had uh, a lot of agricultural activity in their landscape. And he found that they flowed, they flowed muddy and they were building big silt-laden deltas out into the Mediterranean. But then when he went to the mouths of rivers that flowed out of undisturbed forested landscapes uh, in, the, in the Greek uh, uh, peninsula, he found that they flowed clear even in storms and had, had very little sediment piling up down at their mouths. And he connected the dots and basically uh, also looked at things like uh, pedestal trees, trees that were up on pedestals around the surrounding fields and, and realized that the trees hadn't jacked themselves up out of the ground to stand above the surrounding fields, but the fields had eroded away around trees that the farmers hadn't wanted to clear or, or plow over. And so he basically really connected the dots between um, the erosive long-term effects, the multi-generational effects of tillage on the landscape in terms of promoting soil loss, and the ability of the landscape to support people over the long run. So we'll give Plato his due for recognizing that connection. And, and other people have noticed these kinds of issues uh, throughout the years. And my dirt book was essentially an attempt to update those views uh, with what we've learned and can learn back through modern archaeology as well. So let me basically illustrate here why a geologist would view a freshly plowed field as a natural disaster in happening in slow motion. This is a field in my home state of Washington, in eastern Washington, the Palouse region. It's a region with uh, wind deposited loose soils, very fertile soils, if you can find the water to, to, to irrigate them. Um, and so there's a lot of dry land farms up there, and many irrigated ones too. Uh, but the point here being that this is a winter wheat, this is a uh, field that's been used for growing winter wheat. And you'll notice there's no crop on it, and it illustrates what happens when you have uh, rain fall onto a freshly plowed field. Those little channels get cut into the landscape everywhere. Uh, and they, they start, they drag soil downhill to some distance, either depositing it further on the bottom of the hill or taking it off to a stream. In a single year, you could erase this over with a single pass of the plow, would be an agronomic nuisance, not a terribly um, 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 a devastating one. But what happens if it keeps happening year after year after year? And you'll notice the year of this photograph is 1970, decades after the Dust Bowl and its renewed focus and attention on soil conservation in the United States. Um, and this shows you uh, that, that what happen, can happen on a field like the one I just showed you uh, if those kind of rills keep happening year after year after year. This is also from the Palouse. It's, a, again, a winter wheat field. Uh, it's on the edge of the field where you have the farmer's fence row up here that he built around a water cistern uh, to protect his water supply. And between the land surface in 1911 was up here uh, when that fence was first built. By 1961, this cliff had developed at the edge of the field. Um, and what did it happen? Well, from erosion by all those little rills that would form after the fields were plowed. And also, if you always plow in the same direction and push stuff downhill, it shifts stuff gradually downhill. And after 50 years of farming, this particular field was left with a cliff around the, the edge of that fence. Now, how high is that cliff? This little black bar here is a one foot increment on a survey rod. This is about a five foot cliff. Uh, and that five feet eroded off in about 50 years. That's about a, a foot of erosion every decade. That translates into roughly a loss of an inch of soil every year. There's nowhere on earth that for soils form that fast from scratch by breaking down rocks to make new soil. It turns out, though, that you can convert degraded soil back into healthy soil a lot faster than that. Um, but this kind of a uh, pace of soil loss is just, uh, you know, it, 
it's it, it, it hard, if not impossible, for nature to keep up with. Uh, and therein lies the problem that has plagued many societies in the past. Now, I hope you're sitting there going, well, Dave, that's like one field in one corner of Washington state. How representative is that? Well, and that, that pace of soil loss, that inch, inch a year kind of a rate is not representative. Uh, it's, it's the uh, most extreme example I could find a good one of with photographs to go with it because it's you know a very good teaching example. So the right question is, well, what are the more, you know, that, okay, seeing like extreme erosion in one field, what about sort of a whole region? Yeah, you know? so let's look at the Piedmont region in the American Southeast, stretching from Virginia up here in the upper right down to Alabama in the lower left. And this is the hill country in that gray noodle, the Piedmont, not the coastal plain, not the spine of the Appalachians. We could deal with those separately if we wanted to. But uh, Bob Mead and colleagues at the U.S. Geological Survey back in the 1980s or 90s uh, did this regional map of how much topsoil had been lost across the whole Piedmont region. And you'll notice that gray noodle, which is the Piedmont, it's mostly four to 10 inches of topsoil loss over most of the region. There's a few areas with less, few areas with more than 10 inches, but how big a deal is four to 10 inches of topsoil loss? Well, if you go back and you read a lot of the original journals of the, the um, of, uh, early farmers and plantation owners, early European farmers and plantation owners in this region, they wrote about having only 6 to 12 inches of rich black earth over the relatively sterile subsoil. In other words, almost all the topsoil has been eroded off in just a couple hundred years of post-colonial farming across a broad region of the United States that was one of the early breadbaskets of the North American and uh, European colonies. Uh, it kind of puts into perspective what the Romans could have done with a thousand year run at the area about the same size in their heartland in central Italy or what the Greeks did with their thousand year run at, at their landscape a few times. Um, it starts to put into perspective that um, long-term soil loss can actually add up to really big changes in the landscape that you might expect to uh, affect the descendants who, uh, who, who would come later in that landscape. And the, the colonial soil loss was something that was recognized back in colonial um, uh, times. Uh, it was something that people like George Washington pictured here, uh, or Thomas Jefferson uh, wrote actually extensively about in their journals and correspondence about uh, the, their, their concern over the state of the fertility of the North American land, um, their North American farming operations. Um, due to their the crop yields being higher in their grandparents' days than they were in their days. They were um, very concerned about declining soil fertility. And Washington, for example, in a 1796 letter to Alexander Hamilton wrote that a few years more of increased sterility will drive the inhabitants of the Atlantic states westward for support. Whereas if they were taught how to improve the old, instead of going in pursuit of new and productive soils, they would make these acres which now scarcely yield them anything turn out beneficial to themselves. One of the key ten aspects of plantation agriculture in the American South was that you would farm a portion of the plantation, clear the forest, farm it for a while, and you'd get three to five years of very good productivity out of the land before intensive tobacco cultivation in particular would degrade the soil enough that you would then clear off a new patch of forest and start farming it. And Washington had the foresight to basically predict that the future of the United States as a nation of farmers lay in westward migration, not because of some manifest destiny to, to overrun the continent. That idea came later, a century later. His idea was that, we, that his peers were degrading the soils of the eastern seaboard fast enough that they would be compelled to move across the Appalachians to seek out better, more fertile soils as they degraded the soils of the eastern seaboard. That's essentially the story that played out in the 19th century, and there's interesting ties to the run-up to the Civil War. All that is sort of covered in, is covered in the Dirt Book. Uh, but it's not just a story that you know, is limited to North America. This shows you an example from Central America, um, from coffee country in Costa Rica, where I um, visited uh, writing Growing a Revolution, and it shows you two road cuts along one, the same road in the heart of coffee country, in the hill country in Costa Rica. The show, photograph on the left shows you the soil in the jungle. Um, when you, where the road cuts through the jungle, you have about a foot of sort of rich black earth, foot of nice topsoil on top of the, the sort of oranges, very typical tropical subsoil. You go into the coffee plantations that have been farmed for a little under a century, and you notice something's missing. The topsoil's gone. This is subsoil basically right to the ground surface with a little bit of organic matter in the coffee plantation. 
And these coffee growers in the area complain bitterly about the health of their crops. Uh, their productivity is going down. Uh, they're having, they're really struggling to stay in business um, with their um, with their degraded land. And with just a hundred years of farming, has managed to shed virtually the entire topsoil. Um, so, if we then stretch out to the the big picture of the entire planet and ask the question of, well, how fast is soil eroding from farms at a planetary basis? We've seen some examples of some pretty extreme local farms. Uh, so I basically wanted to ask myself that question while I was writing dirt. And then I took about a month to go into the library one summer when my students were out in the field doing their own uh, 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 thesis work. And I basically compiled all the erosion data I could find off of modern farms, literally vacuumed up, I think it was 1,400 journal papers, 1,400 peer-reviewed papers to come up with an average global soil erosion rate off of, plow, you know, of conventionally managed tilled or plowed farms of the average global erosion rate of a millimeter and a half per year at present. At that pace, it takes less than 20 years to erode an inch of fertile soil. Um, and, you know, a millimeter and a half doesn't a year doesn't sound like a very fast pace. You know, your fingernails probably grow faster than that. Um, but geologically, that's a screamingly fast pace. So how fast does nature make soil? How fast can nature undo the damage that um, plowing too frequently might cause to an agricultural landscape? Um, well, nature makes soils at the pace of about 2% of a millimeter a year, about two orders of magnitude less than the pace that modern farming is eroding soils off of farms around the world. And at that pace, that nature's pace of building soils, it takes more than a thousand years to rebuild that inch of soil that mo that modern farming can shed off in about 20 years or so. And I should stress that the erosion problem is not just a modern problem, um, but we didn't have um, you know scientists back in Roman times going out and collecting uh, the sediment yield off of farm fields. We have more data today and more understanding today about what's happening, but the same process is one that affected societies in the past. And it's a process that has not stopped. Uh, if we look at uh, North America, uh, Evan Thaler and Isaac Larson and their colleagues at the uh, University of Massachusetts at Amherst over the last few years have published a, a series of papers looking at the fairly recent rates of soil erosion across the Midwest of the United States, particularly the Corn Belt. And what they found is the median historical erosion rate, so the, uh, for the last couple hundred years, the erosion rate across the Midwest of the U.S. has been about 1.8 millimeters a year, actually a little higher than my global estimate for uh, agriculture at present. Uh, but again, a geologically screamingly fast pace. And what that has meant is that across the extent of the whole U.S. Corn Belt, 35% um, of the cultivated areas, or about a third of the land, has lost its A horizon. In soil science parlance, that's basically the topsoil. The American Midwest has already lost about a third of its top, you know, documented that it's lost about a third of its topsoil in the last uh, um, uh, in the last few hundred years of farming practices. In other words, we're right on track to repeat what was done in Greece or in Rome or other societies around the world that I wrote about in dirt. Um, and if we look at the pace at which these this net soil loss has happened, and we can cast the big picture question of what does this mean for the longevity of human societies or, or agricultural societies? So we can take that net soil loss of about a millimeter a year. That implies erosion of a half meter to one meter thick hill slope soil uh, would only take about 500 to 1,000 years. And this is the thickness, the average thickness of soils on most hill slopes around the world, according to the UN's Global Soil Database. Uh, and that 500 to 1,000 years, that 1,000 year time frame, that's approximately the lifespan of most major agricultural civilizations outside of major river floodplains. So what is it about big river floodplains that allow ag uh, that allow uh, tillage-based agriculture to be sustained for long periods of time in places like the along the Tigris and Euphrates uh, uh, rivers in um, in modern Iraq and along the the Nile in Egypt. They've been farmers have been farmed along the Nile for thousands of years, or the the big rivers of lowland China, or, or the Indus and the Brahmaputra in India, where Indian uh, civilization developed and has been uh, farming the same fields for many for millennia. Why does that work? Well, because think about what happens on a floodplain. It floods. And what do floods do? Well, they don't only bring water. They also bring sediment, silt, sand, clay. And that deposition of fresh sediment along with uh, that settles from the floodwaters on farm fields can refresh soil fertility and replace the soil that's lost um, uh, annually. Remember that uh, average annual uh, erosion rate from tilled fields of about a millimeter a year or so? Well, guess what the size of a single grain of sand is? 
a half a millimeter to two millimeters as your typical range of sizes for sand. Deposition each year of a single grain of sand, in other words, could actually um, undo the, the erosional damage from tillage or plowing. So you ought to be able to plow, uh, plow floodplains for a long time, as long as they're allowed to flood occasionally, um, and maintain the, 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 the presence of the soil on the land. Um, but the soil itself and the preservation is, while it's important, it's not the only element of soil land degradation. There's also the degradation of soil organic matter. And Baumart and colleagues back in 2015 uh, did a review of North American soil degradation uh, and concluded that the soil organic matter content, so, and you can think of soil organic matter being 40% carbon, the soil organic matter content of many soils in North America is only about half of the level at present than they were when first converted from forests or prairies to farmlands. In other words, we've also degraded about half the organic matter in our farm fields, and that turns out to, manage, to matter greatly for soil fertility. So we're not just losing soil, but we've managed to convert a lot of soil that looks like this stuff on the left into stuff like this on the right. These two soils are from adjacent fields in North Carolina in the middle of that gray noodle that I was showing you before. Uh, and they basically show you a convent, the soil dug up from a conventionally managed uh, farm and a soil from a farm that was abandoned back in the 19th century and, and reverted to a woodlot um, where nature has been rebuilding the fertility of the land since then. You'll notice there's a bit of a color difference between these soils. The one under conventional farming practices is, is khaki. It has less than 2% organic matter. Um, it uh, looks like sort of salty, crusty uh, beach sand, which is what it is. It's 10 million year old beach sand, Miocene age beach sand. Uh, the soil on the left is uh, developed from the same parent material, the same geological deposits in the same climate, literally next door, right over the fence line. But it's much darker, and the darkness, that's due to organic matter. That's basically soil carbon. Um, and I've yet to meet a farmer who would rather be farming this crusty uh, uh, khaki stuff than this rich uh, sort of chocolate cake kind of stuff. Um, so we have these two elements of, of soil degradation, the loss of the soil itself from erosion and the loss of soil organic matter, uh, both of which contribute to the declining soil fertility. Uh, so when I started to wrap up and finish writing the dirt book, I was became very interested in the question of, well, could we actually reverse this historical trend of soil degradation around the world? Is soil restoration possible? Could we do it at scale, at planetary scale? And could we do it on profitable, viable farms that are still intensively producing food to feed people? And the place where I really started to become an optimist about all this uh, was a place you might not expect a, a scientist to do a whole lot of field research, and that was in my own backyard. Uh, I had the good fortune to marry a biologist uh, who wanted a garden when we bought a house in Seattle when I got a job teaching at the University of Washington. And her story of uh, taking a very degraded, worn out soil in our yard and restoring it and doing it in remarkably short order uh, made me start wondering about, oh, how is this done? How, what's actually behind soil fertility? And we worked together on the hidden half of nature to look into the role of soil life in converting soil like this khaki stuff on the right, which is the soil that we started with when we bought our house. It was, you know, again, less than 2% organic matter. There wasn't a single worm beneath our lawn when we pulled it off to build the garden that Anne you know, really wanted as a biologist. And over the course of about 10 years, she converted this degraded soil into the soil that we had that is at that house right now on the right, more like about a 10% organic matter content, bring, you know, raising the organic matter content by about a percent a year or so. And how did she do that? She did it with intensive composting and mulching for the most part, and not disturbing the soil surface and feeding the soil food web. So she added lots of compost and mulch to the, to the soil in our yard and our garden, and bacteria and fungi would break that down. Uh, nematodes and protozoa and microarthropods would consume the, the, the fungal mycorrhizae and the bacteria in the soil that were breaking down that compost. And the manure that came out of these um, um, small or tiny organisms was essentially every bit as effective at building soil fertility as cow manure is, except this manure was micro manure. It was being produced within the soil and left within the soil and building the organic matter content of the soil up. Uh, and over the course of a few years, we started to see our soil change from that khaki kind of color to start getting darker and darker. And then the life started coming back in the soil in terms of you know, the tiny organisms and then worms and beetles and 
and birds that came to eat the beetles and ultimately eagles that came to eat the baby crows that were eating the worms out of the yard. Uh, and the botanical world in the garden just flourished under uh, the regime of a very restored soil fertility. And that started to uh, basically get Ann and I thinking about, well, you know, how could this be applied in, um, in agricultural settings? Uh, and, you know, what's the role of that soil life, that soil biology in helping to build fertile soils? And that's where we started to run into the differences between conventional agriculture that emphasizes sort of soil chemistry and soil physics as the primary objectives in terms of managing soil, uh, and regenerative agriculture that really emphasizes cultivating the beneficial life in the soil. Uh, literally bringing the soil back to life or bringing life back to the soil. Um, and this uh, let open the door to thinking about, well, it's one thing to rebuild soil fertility on a small lot in an urban setting. And Anne's talk in part two of this will go far more into what she did in that in the yard. And then also the human health effects of, of rebuilding foods that are enriched in uh, the nu nutrients that are, that are uh, that um, healthy soil help to provision into our crops and our livestock. Um, but th this got me thinking about, you know, it's one thing to do to rebuild soil on your on an urban lot, but what about on a fully viable, economically profitable and productive, intensively managed farm? And that got, led me into the research that led to Growing a Revolution, where I took six months away from the University of Washington, in effect, uh, and visited farmers around the world who had been doing to their farms what Anne had done to our yard. And the, this slide on the right shows you some cores from Rattan Lyle's experiments at the Ohio State University, uh, where he's converting sort of khaki soils into much darker, more organic matter rich soils um, with no-till and, and composting methods. Uh, and but we ba what I basically found in visiting farmers around the world uh, who had done to their farms what Ann done to our yards, was that they all had different uh, particular farming methods, but they all f followed principles that map right onto the principles of, co of what the United Nations calls conservation agriculture, uh, a style of regenerative agriculture that involves minimal or no um, disturbance of the land. So either going no-till no and using minimal chemical use, so trying to minimize the chemical and physical disturbance of the landscape. Uh, maintaining a permanent ground cover, which translates agronomically into cover crops in between cash crops, and to diversify crop rotations or diversify cover crops so that you're not growing the same thing in the same plot of land time and again, which is a recipe for promoting the interests of pests rather than beneficial organisms. And this combination of practices, the minimal disturbance, uh, permanent ground cover, so no-till cover crops and uh, diverse rotations, is pretty much the opposite of what's been promoted in conventional agronomy for the last century, where we've promoted a lot of mechanized tillage, a lot of um, uh, reliance on agrochemical use for both uh, fertility and also pest control, um, and uh, a lot of emphasis on specializing in, in one or two crops, uh, fairly minimal uh, rotations. And what I found is that those, the, the farmers who were very successful at rebuilding the fertility of their land uh, subscribe to the you know, uh, employed practices that subscribe to those general principles, but the practices really varied. So farmers in Ghana and Equatorial Africa, where I visited on subsistence farms, they were using very different practices than, say, uh, farmers uh, working large acreages in the Dakotas would be using in the U.S. The technologies differed, the kind of crops they're growing would differ, um, and their practices would differ. But the but but the actual um, practices followed similar principles. So I'll share with you the stories of, of a couple of the farmers I visited while writing Growing a Revolution. Um, I actually came through uh, both South and North Dakota and including a stop at Minokin Farm uh, when I was uh, reading, uh, researching and writing about and writing Growing a Revolution. I encourage you to read uh, that part of that book as well. Uh, but this gentleman here is Dwayne Beck. He was one of the first people that uh, whose farm I visited in the U.S. Uh, who had um, gone through the process of adopting no-till cover crops and complex rotations at Dakota Lakes Research Farm in South Dakota when he was running that. And what he found, and what I found so intriguing, is that he was able to <coughs> design a farming system that greatly reduced the, the use of diesel, fertilizer, and pesticide. And by greatly reduced, I mean decrease it by more than 50%. Uh, 
And you know, that's actually a big ticket. Those are big ticket items, diesel, fertilizer, and pesticide on modern farms in the U.S. If you can reduce your outlays for those inputs by half and maintain your harvest, that's a recipe for a more profitable farm. And he walked me through his and a number of the farmers he works with's experience, including this one example where you look at the, the yield they'd been getting uh, prior to adopting no-till cover crops and complex rotations, and what happened to their yields after they adopted those new methods, their yields actually bumped up a little bit. So they're harvesting a little more, but they're spending a lot less to do it, and that's a recipe for a more profitable farm. Uh, the experience of farmers in Africa uh, was also uh, uh, similar in the sense of the benefits of uh, adopting these more regenerative practices, um, but they, the methods employed were completely different. They were non-mechanized, non all uh, hand labor, small subsistence farms. And this gentleman here, Kofi Boa, who um, I love his, his hat, got dirt, get soil. I mean, that's the whole thing right there in a nutshell. He runs the no-till center um, uh, in Kumasi, Ghana, where he's been teaching his... Um, 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 uh, the villagers around his region how to move from their traditional slash and burn style of agriculture to adopting no-till with cover crops. They get their diversity in by growing many different crops in the same field using uh, um, uh, hand labor operations. And what's happened is that they had really big erosion problems with their traditional slash and burn style of agriculture and, and by, by going to no-till they've managed to greatly decrease the amount of erosion coming off their fields, basically making erosion a non-issue. And what happened to their crop yields? Well, notice their corn yields went from one and a half tons per hectare to four and a half tons. They tripled. Their cowpeas doubled, 0 0.8 to 1.5. A doubling and tripling of crop yields, that's better than the Green Revolution did in, in introducing a whole new varieties of crops to the landscape. And what Kofi did is he taught his farmers who did not benefit from the Green Revolution because they didn't have the capital to have access to uh, patented seeds or to fertilizers, uh, you know, synthetic fertilizers in, in large volumes. Uh, what they had was their labor in a small plot of land. He taught them a way to think about their soil differently that led them to being able to greatly increase their, their harvests, which radically transformed their economic position for the better. Uh, the the Third farmer that I'll tell you a little bit about uh, is David Brandt, who um, farmed uh, uh, Brandt Family Farm in Carroll, Ohio. Uh, sadly, I just learned the other day that he he passed recently. Uh, he was a wonderful gentleman who was very kind to me in teaching me about what he did at his farm. He's he's a giant of regenerative agriculture that will be missed greatly. Um, and here he's modeling his tillage radishes in his field. Um, he basically uh, was kind enough to uh, show me the details of his operation and walk me through uh, what he did in comparison to what his more conventional neighbors did. His conventional neighbors were doing, uh, who's one of whose so soybean fields is shown there in the background, they were using full tillage, 200 pounds of nitrogen, two and a half quarts of Roundup an acre. Uh, that cost them on average of 500 or so bucks an acre. Uh, back in 2015 when I visited, uh, their yield was around 100 bushels an acre for the county average, and at the four bucks a bushel they were getting then, that meant that they were, his neighbors were losing 100 bucks an acre. The more corn they planted, the more money they lost. That's not, even a geologist can tell you that that's not a very good business model. Um, what was what was Brant doing? He had been doing no-till for 44 years, so he's an early adopter of no-till methods in this area. But then he gradually added cover crops and then diversified his cover crops. Um, and he was using, when I visited his farm, he was using no-till with just a little bit of nitrogen, a little bit of Roundup per acre, a lot less than his neighbors. He was only spending 320 bucks an acre. He had a much higher um, uh, yield than his neighbors. He has very fertile land now. Um, and at four bucks a bushel, he was making 400 bucks an acre when his neighbors were losing 100 bucks an acre. That's the kind of math that started me thinking that, wow, this regenerative ideas, aside these conservation agriculture ideas, might actually really catch on and spread because they seem to be a much better business model for farmers. If you can harvest as much or more and do it by spending less, it's a recipe for a more profitable farm. So how did it work? Well, this is the soil that on, on David's uh, neighbor's farm uh, back in 2014, right before I visited. Uh, the soil on the left is the soil from his farm. Um, notice there's a color difference. It's kind of like those fields in... Um, uh, in North Carolina uh, that I was talking about earlier, you've got the khaki stuff with less than 2% organic matter. You have the dark stuff that's probably 6 or 8% or more organic matter on Brant's farm now. 
uh, and in rebuilding the health and fertility of his soils through his um, uh, regenerative practices, Brandt was able to you know, solidify greatly reducing his input cut use uh, to the point where um, he was much more profitable than his neighbors, um, um, than the neighbor's conventional farm. And it was restoring the soil that did it. The last gentleman I'll show you an example from is uh, Gabe Brown. These are his hands. Uh, he's out in his uh, field where he was uh, running his market garden. The soil in his right hand is what he has um, um, uh, rebuilt on the, the land. The soil he started with is like his neighbor's soil, which is over there on the left. You'll notice again a fairly significant color difference. Um, what is it that actually drove that? This is one of Gabe's slides that he was kind enough to share with me. Um, and it shows you soil building at his ranch from back in 1993. He started with three inches of topsoil that had less than 2% organic matter. He then added crop diversity for his cash crops and integrated cover crops, diversified his cover crops, um, and then ended up in reintegrating livestock into the, the, that a particular field. And by 2010, so in the course of you know, just not even 20 years, he'd tripled his soil organic matter from less than 2% to just over 6%. And he'd also taken his topsoil depth from 3 inches down to 14 inches. Um, that translates into a whole lot of carbon put in, into the ground. Uh, and it also translated into a whole lot less in terms of input costs uh, for Gabe. And he's got a fairly profitable farm now as well. So there's these Soil building practices that can increase the amount of carbon that's in the soil, increase soil fertility, which decreases the, the need for fertilizers and the need for pesticides. It also can actually help soils hold water because for every 1% increase in organic matter in a soil, it results in up to 20,000, the storage capacity for up to 20,000 gallons of water per acre. And that's water that if it sinks into the soil, can be retained there to be taken up by plants. And you know, plants don't just build their biomass from carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. They need the water part to put together those, those sugars to build their bodies. Um, and the idea that uh, regenerative farming practices can be more profitable than conventional ones is one that you don't just need to take my word from it from the experience of the farmers that I uh, visited and interviewed for writing Growing a Revolution, although that was their consistent experience. Claire Lacan and Jonathan Lundgren put a paper out a few years back uh, in 2018, if I recall correctly, where they compared the, um, uh, the expenses and profits from conventional, uh, conventional corn and uh, regenerative fields across uh, a good part of the American Midwest. I think it was about 20 pair, uh, compared farm comparison, if I'm recalling right. So if you look at the conventional farms, and these are for corn fields, uh, you, you're looking at revenue and cost per hectare. So the revenue, uh, the top is where the, the amount of money that was harvested per hectare on average, you extract, you then reduce it by the expenditures for corn seeds, crop insurance, irrigation, fertilizer, all those expenses, drops the profit, drops it down to this level. The white bar at the bottom is the residual that's left over. In other words, the profit. Well, notice for the average of regenerative farms, they harvested more, they had higher yields, and they spent less to grow them, leaving a, a, a fatter profit in the end. That's what really started think, uh, turning me into an optimist on the idea that regenerative farming practices could catch on in a big way. Because if we have the, both the economic interests of the farmer and, and, and society's environmental interests and the environmental interests of the farmer as well in terms of handing down their, their land in as good a shape as they got it to their descendants, uh, they're all starting to line up in terms of these benefits for healthy soil. Uh, so in terms of benefits of healthy soil, I list higher farmer profits at the top because I think that can help drive adoption. Uh, then that is a result of comparable yields after conversion. There can be a several year conversion um, uh, time, but after that, um, it's sort of clean running from what I can tell, uh, where farmers are relying on less fertilizer, pesticide, and fossil fuels to harvest comparable yields. Yeah, that leads to higher profits, but it also results in uh, ancillary benefits in terms of uh, higher levels of soil carbon, which has benefits both for fertility and water retention issues on site, as well as planetary um, uh, advantages in terms of uh, climate issues. And it also results in less off-site pollution because the single best way to reduce the um, uh, input of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus that drive um, uh, deoxygenation of waterways downstream of farms around in the American Midwest and around and at, at the mouth of every major river around the world, there's an anoxic dead zone that's a result of this kind of pollution. The best way to cut that down is to use less 
soluble fertilizer on the farms in the first place. And that's what the regenerative practices allow farmers to do. And there's one other element that I'll talk very briefly about in terms of the studies that went into what your food ate, and that's the comparison of what do regenerative practices do for the quality of the food that we grow and, and, the, and the health of our soil as well. So uh, in, for, for what your food ate, uh, Ann and I, along with uh, Ray Archuleta and Paul Brown, and, um, worked on a comparison of 10, far, 10 paired farms across the United States where we paired a regenerative farm with a neighboring conventional farm, had them grow the same crop, uh, and also tested their representative soil organic matter and soil health scores in their fields, and then looked at the ratios of those among the different paired farms. And what we basically found is that in terms of percent soil organic matter, the regenerative farms on average had about twice as much organic matter in their topsoil. Uh, and in terms of soil health scores, they had a, a, a Haney score of about three times that of the conventional farms. So there seems to be something systematic about these regenerative practices, this combination of no-till cover crops and diversity, where maybe adding livestock in the way that, um, that Gabe Brown had done on his farm, uh, can rebuild the health and fertility of, of the land and do it in remarkably short order because the, the regenerative farmers in this comparison have been doing those combinations of all three things for only between five and ten years, which again, to a geologist like myself, is an incredibly fast time frame for doing something like doubling soil organic matter. But it also resulted in differences in what was in the crops coming off the fields. We did a fairly limited comparison of foods. We had a limited budget, small sample sizes, all the usual caveats one would cast. But what we did find is that for phytochemicals, that things like carotenoids, phenolics, and phytosterols, um, compounds plants make uh, through interactions with their, their microbiome in the soil, um, the, the compounds that plants make that have antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties when they get into our diets. Now, plants aren't making them for us to get be healthy. They're making them for their own purposes, but they translate into uh, uh, health effects on um, for humans, at least according to the medical literature. And certain vitamins had higher levels in the regenerative crops as well. So it seems like there's some evidence for um, well, and this gives you just sort of a sense of that. The phytochemicals are up 15 to 20 percent. Micronutrients, uh, certain micronutrients were up 30, 15 to 30 percent. The soil health scores were 30 percent higher to a couple times higher on the regenerative farms. It starts to put into perspective that something may be going on here uh, with between the health of the land and the health of not only crops, but what gets into our food. Uh, and so we can kind of think in terms of back in terms of the big picture here, that poor soil health can lead to sick crops and farm animals that can help uh, undermine the health of people in terms of um, uh, uh, depleted levels of things that are beneficial to our health in our crops. And you can turn that back around that healthy soil can help support healthy crops and farm animals and translate into healthier people, or at least healthier food, giving people the opportunity to potentially be healthier depending on our other lifestyle choices. Obviously, connecting soil health to human health is fairly complicated. There's a lot of dots to connect in between. That's what we tried to do in writing What Your Food Ate, to take the old arguments by folks like J.I. Rodale and Eve Balfour that uh, the healthy soil uh, translates into healthy crops and animals and that supports the health, the health of people. And look at the, the science that's come out in the last 80 years that allows you to connect those dots, uh, the, the individual pairs of dots, and make the, a, a coherent argument for how, well, how it is soil health may translate into better health for people as well. So where does that leave us today? I, I think we're at a very unique point in history where we're poised for what I like to call the fifth agricultural revolution. So what were the first four? Well, the first agricultural revolution um, really was agriculture in the first place. The idea of cultivating the earth and, and tilling, uh, settling down and abandoning a, a hunter and gather lifestyle to tend a piece of earth and pass that down to one's descendants. Uh, and as the, that led ultimately to what I like to think of as the second agricultural revolution, which is where societies around the world recognize that uh, elements of soil husbandry mattered to sustaining the fertility of their land. And people learned how to plant uh, legumes in crop rotations. So you get a nitrogen fixer in your crop rotation, uh, or that you can um, um, uh, grow a diversity of crops or let your uh, livestock manure your fields. There's lots of methods for soil husbandry that were independently um, discovered in different regions around the world, which actually map into some of those elements of conservation agriculture today, because crop rotations um, and diversity uh, 
are not new ideas in terms of agriculture for, for uh, sustaining soil fertility. Uh, and the quote from Leonardo there is, uh, we know more about the movement of celestial bodies than about the soil underfoot, is my favorite Leonardo da Vinci quote, because how many other quotes from 500 years ago in science are as accurate today as they were 500 years ago? Um, we the soil and the life forms in it and the relationships and the partnerships they forge uh with uh with plants um are, are is really one of the, the the new frontiers in science that we're learning an awful lot about each and every year the third agricultural revolution was when mechanization and industrialization swept through uh with the advent of fossil fuels in the late 19th century it gave us the ability to um, you know, uh, work more land harder, faster, uh, and that basically translated into more a rap more rapid pace of erosion and land degradation in the 20th century than we had seen in previous centuries. Uh, the fourth agricultural revolution, I lumped the green revolution and the biotechnology revolution into a single integrated um, uh, agricultural revolution, sort of the late 20th century technological uh, innovations uh, that led to you know, big increases in crop yields, um, but continued also to contribute to the degradation of soil health and to potentially and to potentially to undermining the nutritional value of the higher yields that we were getting. And where I think we are today is that we're poised for a fifth agricultural revolution, one that's focused more around the ideas of soil health and regenerative agriculture. Um, it's an idea whose, whose time I think has come both economically and environmentally and from a public health perspective. Uh, it's a real major opportunity to rethink our relationship to the land, reevaluate how we think about the soil in our farming practices, and to start experimenting with more um, soil health friendly styles of farming that need not compromise either economic viability of farms or the um, or the environmental viability of sustaining farming over the long run, a trick that so far has been restricted to floodplains. We need to figure out how to do that on all our agricultural land and prioritizing practices that build soil health, I think offers us an avenue towards getting there. So I'll leave you with that. Uh, uh, Ann and I obviously recommend our books to you, Dirt, Hidden Half of Nature, Growing Revolution, and What's Your Food Ate. You can read them in any order that you want. If you're really into history, I'd start with dirt. If you're really into microbes, I'd start with the hidden half. If you want the inspirational examples of some of the, the early adopters of regenerative agriculture, Growing a Revolution, and if you're interested in the human health connections, What's Your Food Ate tries to do a deep dive into the science behind how soil health can translate into human health for better or for worse. So I will um, thank you for your attention. Appreciate the, the opportunity to share um, this stuff with you. And I will leave you there um, and wish you all the best from out here in Seattle.